morning. If you're here, you're here to learn about the technical best practices we validate as part of the APM programs. To prepare for the talk today, Mike and I, we have gone through thousands of partner applications and identified a summarized top five most challenge areas we see partners are facing with. So with today's talk, we will talk about how to address these gaps and then help you complete that, complete that partner validation you're looking for to differentiate your solutions. The talk is 200 level. Uh, it's intended for a technical audience. We do stay high level in terms of the well-architected area, and we do not go into details on a solution or coding examples. However, we'll provide you additional resources for you to dig deeper afterwards. So we'll be focusing on the technical validation of the APM programs. If you're interested in learning about how to apply and the details of different APM programs, you can visit our booth at the APM booth at Expo Hall. So my name is Jing. I am the tech lead for APM program validations. I primarily work with consulting partners. I'm also the primary author of the new competency checklist we're going to release at the end of the year. I'm joined by Mike. Mike, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone, uh, Mike Deck. I lead the team of uh, solutions architects responsible for our technical validation programs. I've uh, been involved with the, these programs for a number of years at this point, kind of started off my career focused on software partners. Uh, so I'll be talking a lot about that today and uh, really looking forward to the conversation. Great. So let's get started. By show of hands, how many of you are AWS partners? OK, great. I think most of you are. This is definitely a session designed for you. I want you to walk away with a deeper knowledge and understanding on the technical best practices and also the effective tips for you to be able to go ahead and complete a success validation. If you are an AWS customer, you may also find value in knowing how to choose a partner or have the right question to ask. And most importantly, you can apply these best practices to your own workload. Second question, still show of hands. Have you completed APM program validation before? This could be competency, foundational technical review, managed service offerings. OK, about half of the room. So for the ones who have done it, thank you. We would like to hear from you. So find me and Mike throughout the week. And we'd like to hear details about what's working and what we would like to think about on improving. Um, so throughout today's talk, I'll highlight the updates and the changes we're making for you so that you can continue to leverage this programs, this validations um, to help you build a solid solution for your customer. For the ones who haven't done it, <clears throat> this is definitely the session for you to self-assess, identify the gap, and get ready to do so. All right, so why do we validate partners? The most important reason is customer obsession. We we're doing this for AWS customers. We often have customers asking us, recommend a partner to work with. Before we can give our customer a name or solution, we wanna be comfortable where we're looking at. We wanna be credible with our partner, with our customers. So we use APM programs to validate these solutions. Again, competency, service delivery, service ready, you might be heard of all of them. So the technical validation part of it is really helping us to establish that credibility and trust with our customers so that they come back to us again for AWS solutions. We'll be checking about whether the partners can securely configure AWS account, whether they're building resilience architectures for the customer workload, and so on and so forth. Um, of course, we want AWS partners to succeed as well. So we recommend prioritizing implementing this most fundamental test, technical best practices for your, uh, which proven to lead to customer success. So by doing so, by implementing this in your own workload or in the customer workload, you can really help differentiate yourself and establish that competitive market condition for your customers. 
So if we talk about we are doing this for both customers and AWS partners, what are they saying about this technical validations? The first one I want to share is from customer Stockland. This is, the, this is a customer where they need help migrating and operating SAP on AWS. So they ask us to recommend a, a partner. So in this case, we recommended Lemongrass. This is a premier consulting partner. We recommended them because we have vetted their solutions. We've seen how they've demonstrated customer success in this exact domain areas. So when we recommend our partner to the, to the customer in this case, they were happy with the recommendations. They had a very successful project engagement. So the next quote I like, this is from a AWS partner. So this is Megazone Cloud, a Korean partner. They are managed service providers. They leverage the competency, actually quite a few of them, from different industry vertical, horizontal, to really establish their competitiveness within their customer segment. They demonstrate it, they can do it, and they do it well. With those multiple badges they earned for competency, they are able to attract, attract customer deals and grow their global business by five times more, five to 10 times more. So if both partners and customers are saying these are useful, what are our validation criteria? Two things we look for. The first one is, are you following best practices? This is really to see whether you have the tech, tech, technical capability and know-how to be able to build those solutions for a customer. Second, have you done it before? Do you have a track record of success customer use case? So we need to see that you're able to implement those solutions for similar use case before. So overall, we look for technical capability as well as demonstrated customer success for this validation. So when you do this validation, the evidence we look for is slightly different if you're validating a software product versus a um, service. So for software product, we look through the solution detail and features with how you're configuring different, con configuring different resources, what's your architecture design, what's your operational processes to handle logging, monitoring, incident response. We need to check the details. When it comes to service offering, this include managed service offering, professional services, consulting services, we do also look at this, how, do, how are you implementing solution, what's your architecture design, but most importantly, we're focusing on what's your standard mechanism in place. This includes security SOPs, documents, processes, training materials to successfully onboard both your new customer and your consultants. So there's a lot of simplification we did over here. I'd like to highlight the change that currently for competency checklists, we asked you and we check solution details for every single one of the four customer example you provide. But going forward, when we release the new checklist at the end of the year, we're shifting that to a simplified model where we check what's your standard mechanism in place and give us one use case you demonstrated successful use of that. So Mike will talk a little bit more about that detail in the second half of the talk. So now we talked about why we're doing validation, what are we looking for in this validation. I'll turn over to Mike to start us on the five challenge areas we have identified. Great. Thanks, Jing. Um, so yeah, so as Jing mentioned, you know, we've done thousands of these validations working with partners just like yourselves. Um, and, and we looked through that to kind of understand where do we see gaps? Where, where do we see partners coming to us and having problems kind of passing the technical bar that we've set? Um, condense that down into sort of these three or these five key themes uh, and that's what we want to talk about today is how, how can you make sure that you don't fall into these same problems how can you address these issues yourself um, so we're gonna dig into those because before I get started one thing I would like to understand how many people here um, work primarily in a consulting consultative uh, services partner model versus software and how many folks sell software products as your primary thing okay perfect so we've got a, a good split here. We're going to be talking about kind of both of these. So we've kind of looked across the board, and it turns out that, that a lot of these themes are relatively consistent. There's some differences in how we really evaluate 
these on, on each type of partner, uh, but we'll kind of get into the nuances of that uh, through, through each one of these items. So let's go ahead and kick it off and talk a little bit about basic account security. So as the name implies, this is really foundational stuff. My hope and expectation is that most of you are probably already doing a lot of this. Um, however, statistically, based on what we see, I know that there are a few folks out there where there's probably some gaps here, uh, and, and it's really, really critical to kind of get this stuff right up front. So no matter how good your security is when, when it comes to configuring security groups and setting up firewalls and you know, putting in place additional uh, security controls, if you don't have your, uh, your AWS account locked down to begin with, that can undermine everything else that you're doing. So this is really kind of where we start the conversation and something that we want to make sure everyone is prioritizing and getting right up front. So what do we mean when we talk about you know, basic account security? There's really kind of three key things that we're talking about here. First of all, set your account contacts, secure the root user, and enable CloudTrail. And do this on every single account that you create or own or manage. Make sure that this is done across the board. This should be really your number one priority. It's just table stakes. Um, so let's talk about setting account contacts. Why, why is that important? Well, anyone who owns the email address and phone number as your primary account contacts can reset the root password on your account. They can get access to everything in your account and, and go and, and make changes as, as they like. So it's really critical that you make sure that when you configure a new account or any of the existing accounts that you have are using corporate email addresses and phone numbers that are owned by the company, not by individuals. We see this all the time where someone comes in, they create a new AWS account to start doing a prototype on something. They use their Gmail uh, email address and they use a cell phone number to, to kind of get things started. Forget about what happened. A couple months or a couple years later, maybe they leave the company, no one really realizes, and then all of a sudden what happens if, if you need to go and reset the, the password on that account? Or what happens if they decide to reset the password on that account themselves, right? Um, so this, this tends to be a problem. It's, it's an easy thing to fix. You just gotta go and make sure that all of your accounts have been configured correctly. It's also really important to set the alternate contacts as well. So you'll see there's billing, operations, and security contacts. We use those to uh, send important information about uh, your account. If we, if we detect something is going on, uh, we send updates, et cetera, there. Uh, so, so we want to make sure that you're, you've got those set, that they're, they're sending information to the right uh, endpoints that you'll be able to see and, and uh, consume that. So uh, that's kind of step one. Make sure that you're setting that up correctly. Now step two is securing the root user. Again, super critical. If someone has the root user, if someone has root user access, you can't limit the permissions on that. They have access to everything in your account and they can make changes to anything. So again, this is really that foundational layer that you've got to get, make sure you get right. And the number one rule of securing the root user is don't use the root user. There's actually very few reasons that you need to log in as root. So you're much better off creating IAM principles, setting up federation, logging in with SSO, uh, for any day-to-day -day tasks. Like generally speaking, if you're doing work in an AWS account, you should be using an IAM role uh, or perhaps an IAM user. Uh, don't use root in general. So set a really strong password on your root user, lock it away in a password vault, and generally speaking, don't touch it. Um, now before you go and lock it away, a couple of other things you need to do first. First of all, enable multi-factor authentication. So in case someone does get that password, they won't be able to log in unless they've also got your MFA token. Um, and then also, make sure that you remove access keys. Um, so access keys are different than the password that you use to log in to the console. Uh, access keys are, are used for things like the CLI or making programmatic API calls. Um, and again, what, like we said, you shouldn't be using the root account for, for general use. Um, and so there's really no reason to be using root account credentials in programmatic access patterns. Um, so you're best off just deleting those. If they're deleted, they can't be lost. Uh, and that's just a good extra, extra layer of security there before you do that. So final step that we talked about is uh, enabling CloudTrail. So if you're not familiar with CloudTrail, uh, CloudTrail provides an audit log of all of the activity in your AWS account. So if someone goes in and creates a security group, they terminate an instance, they go and update the settings on a Lambda function, any of those kind of things are going to get logged inside of CloudTrail. Um, so this is a really, really useful tool to have in case you need to go in and investigate what's going on. You can also use this as a mechanism to uh, you know, alert and, and, and monitor the activity that's going on in your account. Um, so it's really important that you enable this in all regions. Um, so CloudTrail, like a lot of our services, is a regional service. Um, and a lot of partners come and, and talk to us and say, oh, well, you know, I'm not using uh, US West 1, I don't have anything running in California, so why do I need to enable CloudTrail there? Well, 
what we see is a lot of times if someone does get unauthorized access to your account, the first thing they're gonna do is go and launch resources in the, in the regions that you're not using because you're less likely to see them there. So having visibility into those areas is actually really important. And from a cost perspective, you know, CloudTrail itself is, does not cost anything. You do pay to store the logs in S3, uh, but if you're not really using a region, it's generally not gonna generate a lot of log activity. So um, this is really just a good sort of extra layer of, of security to have in place. So make sure that you're enabling CloudTrail using the global setting. You can set that up on a single tray. You don't have to log in every, indiv every individual region. You can set that up once, make sure that you're covered across all regions. Um, and then in addition to that, we also wanna make sure that you're securing the logs that you've created, right? So you wanna make sure that these are uh, resistant to being tampered with. You don't want someone to be able to come in, do something bad, and then cover their tracks, right? So um, a couple of best practices there. One, send the, send the logs to a different AWS account. Um, set up a separate security logging account, send your logs there, and then make sure that you've configured log file, val log file integrity validation uh, within your trail, as well as securing the S3 bucket itself, enabling things like versioning, MFA delete. There's a lot of details that we've got in, in our individual checklist that talk about the specifics there, um, but basically the key is make sure that you've got those logs locked down. So, um, so that's kind of the, the kind of core concepts that we look at when we're talking about basic account security. So when it comes to executing the validation, when you come to us and apply as a software partner, uh, this is the kind of stuff that we're going to check during the foundational technical review. Uh, when you apply for a foundational technical review, what we're looking for is one, have you followed these best practices that I just laid out in all of the accounts that you're using to handle customer data? Um, again, this is the standard thing, no matter who you are, even if you're not a partner, even if you're not doing anything, if you've got AWS accounts, please follow these best practices. Um, and we wanna see that you're doing that across the board. And then we use something called the CIS AWS Foundations Benchmark to, uh, to assess this. So this gives you a nice way to uh, use an automated tool to understand, have you set this stuff up correctly? You can use tools like AWS Security Hub. There's also lots of great partner products out there that support this industry standard benchmark. It'll run an automatic assessment of your account, tell you where you've got problems, tell you if you've got MFA enabled, tell you if you've got CloudTrail on all of those kind of good things. Um, and, and so as part of the validation, we ask that you go and run one of those reports, uh, attach that to your application, that's how we check to see that this is all in place. Um, so one of the resources for kind of further reading is, is our uh, FTR technical, I'm sorry, the uh, foundational technical review guide. Um, so this QR code will link you out to the public FTR page. If you go down into the, uh, the specific steps off of that page, you can go and find a link to the guide that walks through all of the specific details. It'll give you a link to the checklist where you can read up on the, the, the kind of specific individual controls that we look for here and, and get the, the rest of the technical details there. Um, so that's if you are running a SaaS solution, if you're a software, pro, a software product where you're hosting it in your own account. Um, if you don't host the software yourself, if you give it to your customers, have them deploy it, obviously, this is not really applicable. This doesn't, uh, you know, the, the customer is the one that's responsible for this. So we don't actually check that for cases where you're, you know, selling an AMI on Marketplace. And then certainly if you're a consulting partner, uh, things are a little bit different as well because typically you're engaged in more of a project-oriented uh, model and so you don't have direct access to this. So we think about this a little bit differently and I'll hand it over to Jing to talk a little bit about how we think about this for consulting partners. Thank you. For service partners, um, we also want to make sure you have the right security posture. Just like what Mike mentioned, these are critical, um, important security. You got to make sure the consultants know what they're doing. We want to make sure our customers knows what we're doing when we create accounts for them. So like we mentioned earlier, we look for evidence of standard processes of service partners when it comes to technical validation. So in particular here, we require service partner to develop a security SOP on AWS account governance. And the content of that should include all the three things Mike just mentioned. Set corporate information on the account and making sure that you secure root user and then set up dedicated cloud trail. So with all of that, you may say, well, when I do a project engagement with my customer, I don't need it. They don't require me to create those accounts. And that's fine. What we wanted to check, we want to make sure is you acted as a trusted advisor, you're equipped with this knowledge, the know-how, when customers do ask you, 
And that's why we also say, give us the security SOP you develop, making sure your consultants are following, and give us one damaged use case where you have helped a customer on this, instead of repeatedly checking every single one of your customer engagement. So we talked about the consequences of not doing this can be detrimental. We've seen consulting partners have their consultant created AWS account using their Gmail, then they left the company, and the partner doesn't even know what's the current status with the customer because they left that engagement. And customer were stranded with not only being able to perform any root user related activity, but they're, they're left with a secure, huge security risk. And it's not to say that they have bad intentions by doing it, is they're not prioritizing it, or they don't have the standard guidance to follow. They're probably eager to jump into helping the customer really creating that solution for the use case. And that's why we require uh, all the service partners to have this consistency on AWS account governance. For many service offering providers, we have additional requirement that they should implement a security monitoring dashboard so they have visibility to all AWS customer accounts. So I would recommend everybody to go back and check out your ongoing customer engagement on this piece of where your consultant created AWS account for your customer, making sure all the details Mike mentioned, they're there, they're secure, it's done properly. This is definitely a good way to earn your customer trust. Show them that you have the technical know-how of how to do this. Um, good thing is you don't have to reinvent wells. You, you can and you should leverage what AWS has in terms of best practices. We have a link here. It's a prescriptive guidance, teaches you step by step how to create account, how to secure them, how to lock away all the access keys and all these important things. So take a look at that and incorporate it into your internal SOP. So uh, the next area we wanna talk about is also security related. This is account, customer account access. This is a very common scenario most AWS partners face. Either the software product need to access to customer data, customer application, or your consultants needs to access customers' resources in their AWS account. This is the scenario where you should leverage AWS Identity and Access Management, IAM. Um, the first and foremost important principle is to avoid using static credentials, such as long-term access keys in IAM. IAM access, access keys can be used by anyone, anywhere. So the problem with sharing this IAM access keys is it can be used unless the customer explicitly revoke them. This creates a lot of issue with both partners and customers. So when customers share that, they're trusting you or able to adhere to the best practices or guarding these keys. And then as a partner, you have to make sure that you are securing this, you're rotating them, and you would rather spend those good billable hours on really implementing solutions rather than managing keys. So instead, we recommend you to work with customers to create temporary security credentials. And it can be really useful when it comes to cross-account access I am roles or identity federation. In particular, we require and recommend you to use IAM roles for workload and code access. And for human, human user, we require you to use federation with identity provider uh, from customer for, to federate in, into their account and onboarding, uh, onboard into customer account. Lastly, when setting IAM permissions using policies, you really need to grant, only grant the permission needed to perform that task. Uh, we recommend you do this by least privileged permissions. You can start out, when you're starting out exploring your workload or use case, start out broad, and then as your use case and workload mature, you can work to narrow down that towards least privileged permissions. You can leverage the tool of uh, IAM, Access Analyzer, to analyze the CloudTrail login activities and auto-generate such policies for you, then you can fine tune it afterwards. So the requirement we have when it comes to service, par service partners, again, the same theme you'll hear me repeating throughout the talk, we need everybody to have a standard approach to access customer account and incorporate AWS IAM best, best practices in it. 
for um, this, this best practice should include customer issued identity to federate, federate into their environment assumed roles and uh, avoid long live credentials like I am users. Most importantly, work with your customer to finalize it. We understand there are circumstances where customers only giving out I am users for whatever reason that is, and that is okay. And use this chance to educate your partner, educate your customer, showcase that what's the recommended best practices by giving them the guidance and advise them how to do it. For MSP, AWS partner should use a centralized identity provider for managing access to AWS account. We recommend you look into AWS IAM Identity Center to manage access um, of your account and permissions with those uh, permissions with those user identities from external identity provider as well. So the resources we paste out here is AWS Security Best Practice in IAM. AWS constantly update this content. The latest one we have updated is the past June. So recommend you to frequently check this and making sure everybody stay up to date with what's the best practice recommendation. The last thing I want to show here is a visualization of the best practices of architecture diagram. Again, to require your human user to use temporary credentials when accessing customer AWS account. You can work with your customer to issue identity, federation, identity provider for your consultant so they can get onboarded into customer account. We see oftentimes customer adding partner con consultants into their active directory for SSO access. Um, and this is the way we recommend. And it's important that to understand when you're faced with customers who are not familiar with these best practices, we wanted you to be able to guide them through this process. And of course, the specific customer engagement may vary, but having this ready for you, for your internal consultants, for your customers is really key. Great, so let's talk a little bit about from a software product perspective, how do we think about this, right? So again, it's, a, it's gonna be a different kind of paradigm, but fundamentally what we really care about is avoiding the use of static credentials and making sure you're following best practices anytime you're accessing customer AWS assets. Um, so really kind of the key thing to keep in mind is if you have a SaaS product and you are asking your customers to provide you with an access key and secret key, that's wrong. Change that. We don't want you to, to do it that way. Instead, the way to do it is to use a, a cross-account role, have the customer create a role in their account that trusts your account uh, and use that to, to make access calls, right? So that's really kind of the, the key thing that we're, we're really looking at uh, when we talk about this. This applies you know, primarily to SaaS uh, providers, and, and in a lot of cases, depending on the type of application you have, you may not need access to the customer's account at all, right? So if you've got an accounting software platform, you're probably not going in and, and accessing APIs within the customer's AWS account. This is not really applicable. You don't need to worry about it. Um, but in the case that you have a DevOps tool or security scanning software, something that needs to go in and you know, directly interact with customer resources, this is the right way to do it. Um, so when it comes to the specific criteria, again, this is the kind of stuff that we're looking at in the foundational technical review in that very first review that we're gonna do uh, with any software partner that, that uh, we work with. Um, like we said, use IAM roles, don't use users, don't use static credentials. Um, automate and document the permissions and configuration that your customers need to set up. So if your customers need to grant you access, make sure you're very, very clear on exactly what permissions your application needs, what is the policy document that they can use to go uh, and set that up and configure it correctly. Don't, don't leave it to them to kind of figure that out on their own. Um, the next step is using external ID correctly. So this is a little bit more of a uh, kind of nuanced aspect of IAM. There's a concept called external ID. Basically, it's used to prevent what's called the confused deputy problem. Um, I don't have time to kind of get into all of the details of exactly how that works uh, right now, but if you look at the IAM documentation on how IAM roles work and how cross-account trust policies work, uh, there's a really great explanation in the documentation. Um, it, it is relatively straightforward to set up, but you just want to make sure that you are using external IDs uh, when you're asking your customers to create roles and that you're enforcing all of the best practices associated with that. And then the last piece is 
again, deprecating the use of static credentials. So if you're doing that today, if, you're, if you have uh, a software product where you are asking for static credentials and you've got existing customers that are onboarded that way, that's okay. We recognize that you know, we're, we don't want you to go and disrupt customer operations and turn that off on them or force them to go and you know, update that on a really short timeline. That can be very disruptive. Um, so it's fine if you want to continue to support that for some time frame in the, in the future, but the key is don't force any of your new customers to create static credentials. That's really the key. We want to make sure that any new customers are using roles, um, and that's really kind of the, the, the key point there. Um, so moving on to our third topic, uh, resilience. So why is resilience important? You know, I think Werner said it best when he said everything fails all the time. Uh, and so what we really, you know, what's really important is that when you are building solutions for your customers, you're taking this into account and you're designing appropriately to be able to handle those inevitable failures. Um, and we want to see that you've architected things in a way that, uh, uh, that are resilient to, to individual component failures and ensure that you're able to deliver the right level of availability to your customers. So. Um, we recently released uh, this new shared responsibility model for resilience. I'm not sure if folks have seen this, but uh, you should definitely go and check it out. I've got a link in uh, one of the next slides uh, with, with the link to this. Um, but basically, this, this talks about how at AWS, we think of resilience as a shared responsibility. You may be familiar with the security shared responsibility model. It's very similar here. AWS is responsible for the resilience of the cloud, of the specific hardware, global infrastructure, and services that we run. Uh, and our customers are responsible for the resilience of their workloads, making sure that they're architected to handle failures of the underlying components, uh, testing, managing uh, quotas, et cetera. Um, and so the key point here is to make sure that you understand that while AWS spends a lot of time and a lot of energy, we've got tons and tons of really smart engineers working extremely hard to make sure that our services are reliable as possible, just because you're building on top of those doesn't mean that you don't have any responsibility to make sure that your, your applications and workloads um, are resilient and are achieving the, the availability goals that you need. So when it comes to designing for resilience and thinking about availability, this is one of those areas that unlike security, I can't necessarily tell you exactly what the right answer is or what the, what the hard requirement is, right? Because at the end of the day, this is always going to be a balance between the needs of the business and the cost and complexity that you're willing to accept, right? So when it comes to you know, your recovery time objectives, your recovery point objectives, mean time to, re uh, mean time to recovery uh, on your workloads, depending on the type of application you have, depending on the needs of the business, you may or may not want to, to you know, increase or decrease the amount of, of money, time, and, and complexity that you're spending in order to drive higher goals in these areas. So when we're validating partner solutions, we're not necessarily concerned specifically about how you decide to balance this for your own business and for your customers. What we care about is that you're being intentional about making this choice. We see a lot of cases where people jump right in, they grab some reference architecture, uh, and they just start building, expecting that you know, this is the right way to do it. But, but they haven't necessarily actually thought about, well, what, what are the goals that we're trying to drive? What, what is the sort of level of availability that's necessary? Does this need to have five nines of availability? Is two nines acceptable? Is it somewhere in between? Um, and so really what we want to see is that you're thinking about these things and making these trade-offs intentionally as opposed to just sort of build, building an architecture without considering these things. Um, so first step is set goals on these things. Understand what are the business objectives here? What do you need uh, to be able to deliver? What's acceptable? And then based on that, you can go and build out the inappropriate architecture. So in some cases, it may actually be acceptable to say, hey, we're going to deploy this to a single availability zone. We're just going to have an auto-scaling group that's going to automatically replace instances if, uh, if they fall over. That's not going to give you an extremely highly available system, but it is very simple and it is relatively inexpensive to run. Um, on the other hand, you may be doing work for you know, a large financial institution that needs their system to be up 24 seven no matter what, in which case you're probably starting to look at multi-region deployments and, and deploying using other services and, and replicating data live, having active active routing layers and things like that. Um, that's obviously a much more expensive proposition, much more complex and time consuming to build. Um, but if that's, the, if that's the business requirement, then that's the appropriate thing to do. Um, now, I wouldn't recommend doing this all the time. If you don't need it, it's not worth it. But um, 
but absolutely, you, you need to be making that choice intentionally. That's really kind of the bottom line here. The other thing to think about is this goes beyond just the architecture, right? So it goes beyond just, are you using multiple availability zones? Are you doing multi-region? You also need to be thinking about the other aspects of your operations, monitoring, observability. How are you deploying things? Are you using canary deployments? Are you, you, you know, what does your, your recovery uh, processes look like? Have you automated rollbacks, et cetera? Um, depending, again, on, on the level of availability and the goals that you've got here, uh, you need to consider all of those aspects, um, and, and those are the things that we really kind of look at um, when we're validating your solution. So, talking again about, you know, what do we look for in a software solution? Um, you know, again, what we're primarily concerned with is, have you thought about this? Have you defined your goals? Can you tell me, what is your RTO? What is your RPO? Um, we want to see that you've thought about this and, be, and that you're being intentional about it. The specific numbers that you have are, in most cases, not important. There are a few cases where we say for specific industries, we expect a certain level. You know, we, we, we don't think it's acceptable to have you know, extremely long RTOs and certain you know, mission critical applications. But, but in general, across the board, what we care about is that you're being intentional about this. Um, and then we want to see that you've implemented an architecture that's appropriate for the goals you've set. Um, so again, I can't tell you specifically every single application you've got has to be across multiple AZs or you need to use multi-regional architectures in these cases and that. Again, the, the goal here is to kind of understand what are the goals that you're trying to achieve and have you been thoughtful in how you've designed your, your system to, to implement that. The other big piece that we see a lot of partners miss is around testing. Um, so any system that you build, you're gonna have processes in place to recover from failures. You need to make sure that those are being tested. We wanna see that you've actually gone through, ran the game day, understand how this works for real, because every single time I've seen someone test their recovery procedures, they've learned something new about how their system works in those scenarios, and they've figured out something that they needed to fix. Um, and then lastly, we wanna make sure that communicating to customers, what's their responsibility in all of this? Are you taking backups of, of their data? Um, or is that on their side of the, the shared responsibility? Is that, is that they're uh, up to them? Um, again, there's no right or wrong answer to that. The key is that you're clear in how you're communicating that to customers so that they understand what they need to do in order to meet the resilience goals that they've got. Now for service partners. Oh, sorry, I think I went. For service partners, resilience discussion is really a key component to their, and their trust. Like what Mike mentioned, unlike security, we want everybody to be doing exact the same thing. AWS partners, customers, we wanted those security best practice to be in everywhere consistently. Resilience is where we need to see variation. We need to see that you're proactively engaging with your customer. You talked about the trade-off between resilience and cost. You have customized decisions for that particular application. So uh, having 15 minutes RTO and one minute data loss, it sounds great, right? But your customer application may not need it. And most importantly, that increase the, com the complexity to operate and maintain them. When you're end of the project management, customer are the ones responsible for managing it. So that's a lot of consideration there. On the other hand, if you're doing 35 days um, data loss for extensive retail data collection, that may sound really good to operate, but it may be harming the customer's fundamental business lines. So it really comes down to a joint discussion and conversation with the customer and talk about what's the risk or downtime. What do we do when this happens, when outage happens? How do we respond to it? And really have that discussion on investing the money, time, and effort for this resilience discussion. The call out I wanna make over here is we changed from all, requiring all the service partner to give us clearly defined RTO or PO for each customer engagement. We changed from that to say, go to a customer engagement and suggest a resilience policy for the application. With your advice or that RTO or PO, what is that customer conversation? What is that trade of discussion? And that is okay if at the end of the day, customer is not ready to take your suggestion or they're not ready to take on complicated um, the R process, and that is okay. But we need to see that intentional discussion and also demonstrate one use case where you've successfully worked with the customer on building a resilient workload. Uh, so that's what I call out. The couple of resources over here to help you. The first one is what Mike mentioned earlier. We have this new white paper 
on shared responsibility model for resilience. And the second one is you're probably familiar with the well-architected resilience pillar, white paper. The third one is actually a tool that you can leverage, AWS Resilience Hub, where it's used to define, validate, and track a resilience goal for a particular workload. You can work with your customer on define a resilience policy, set those goals and objectives, and this tool can help you assess whether the design architecture can achieve it and constantly monitoring it. It really helps you to uncover your resilience weakness and really work towards a resilient architecture that's appropriate for that particular use case. Okay, next, we're moving on to workload health monitoring. So this is part of the operational excellence pillar of well-architected framework. Essentially, define, capture, and analyze the workload matrix to gain visibility of the workload events. So when issues happen, anomaly or identified, you and the customer have a way to react to those and take appropriate actions. Um, I'm not going to go into details into each of the four areas. We've seen partners done really well in terms of define and monitor them. And I do want to highlight the gaps we see from the partner application or the way how they're doing the workload monitoring. The first one is working backwards from that customer business goals and really establish the correlation of the workload health, especially identifying the trends and patterns, what they mean to the original customer business goal. Because having, work, having operational excellence is not just about is functional operationally, but also uh, the underlying business pers perspective is serving. That's really important. So similarly, the gap we saw is that when anomaly happens, what do we do? Like, what does that mean in terms of there's high utilization, in terms of the resource you, you, you provision for customer? Partners should help customer understand the consequences of this anomaly and suggest um, appropriate action steps. Example we often see is partners saying, we're running primarily with serverless Lambda for majority of the workload, and we are monitoring functional utilization and the provision of coherent usage, and we're monitoring all this in CloudWatch. Great, but what does it mean when you're having a surge of those APN call requests? How would a customer react differently? The answer will be different if they're using Lambda to do a data transformation versus they're using Lambda to do web authentication with the Cognito, right? So these are the things we need to see. These are the things we need to call out through the each, each and every one of the customer engagement to say, what, is, what does it mean for the specific use case you're having? So that's highlighted. We want to make sure that's the difference. We want to make sure that everybody's aware of. When it comes to specific um, validation requirement, we already talked about this. Again, you wanted to be able to have that monitoring workflow to say this is how we talk about customer business goal. This is what the um, parameter we're gonna monitoring. This is what the application layer emit, emission we're gonna make sure we have. This is the threshold of this matrix and this is what actions we're gonna take when things do go, do go wrong. So the guidance with customer on how to integrate with their own operational process and tools is critical. We want to make sure we have those dashboard, not just from a technical perspective, but also the business perspective as well. And again, this is very important to consult engagement. So lastly, this monitoring should be done with centralized logging tool, for example, AWS CloudWatch. Most of you hopefully are already doing that. Um, to get started, you can look into um, this link, um, setting up a CloudWatch logs. Great. So yeah, so from a software partner perspective, uh, again, similar concepts overall, but really what we're going to ask you for when we look at your application is, have you defined metrics and thresholds to, to define workload health? Do you, do you have monitoring in place for these specific metrics? Or are you being intentional about it? Again, the whole idea here is, are, are you going in and just saying, oh yeah, you know, CPU utilization is an easy one. We'll, we'll throw a, a, you know, a CloudWatch alert on that. Um, or are you actually kind of working backwards from the, the business goals and the customer experience and, and monitoring that directly so that you understand when the customer experience is impaired? Um, the other big piece of this is implementing alerting, right? So we want to make sure that you're not just monitoring these things. You don't just have pretty graphs, but you actually have a way to alert people when, hey, there's a problem going on. We need a human to get involved and go and address something. 
Um, and then the next step of that too is, okay, alerting is great, but if you've got alerts in place, but people don't really know what they need to do in, in the event that this happens, uh, that's not very good either. So we wanna see that you've actually got documented playbooks or run books that, uh, that help your operations staff go and troubleshoot and, and deal with problems when they come up and when you get these alerts. So moving on to our, our last sort of theme for this talk, the, the last challenge that we see is around kind of customer handover and shared responsibility. And we, we talked a little bit about this in the resilience piece, but really want to kind of talk specifically about um, the, that interface and making sure that how do customers sort of take over the workload from you um, is, is a really critical thing that, that we want to make sure is, is taken care of. So we talked about the shared responsibility model, this idea that AWS has the responsibility um, sort of of the cloud, customers have the responsibility in the cloud. But really it's important to recognize that there's actually sort of this additional layer between you and your customers that, that you also need to, to negotiate and understand who's responsible for what. Um, so this comes into play whether you're building a project uh, as a consultant and, and you're, you're finalizing things and handing it over to the customer, um, or if you're selling them a software product and, and handing it to them, they need to go and operate it themselves. Um, what, what resources are you giving them to make sure that they're going to be successful there? Are you sure that they understand what falls into that green box and is, is their responsibility? Um, so, you know, overall this is relatively straightforward, kind of the guidance that we're looking for here, or the, the, the best practices that we have here. Um, the key to it is just making sure that you're, you're documenting and thinking about what does that next layer look like when you're handing things over. When, when a customer is gonna take this from you and they're on the hook for making sure that it's up and running and they're gonna entrust their business to this solution, what do they need to know in order to make sure that that's successful? So that involves developing handover processes, making sure that that's a standardized thing. Having standardized deployment assets is also really, really important um, so that you can know that things are, are gonna get deployed in a, a, a standardized way that, that customers can do this without having to go and reinvent the wheel for themselves. Um, and then also, yeah, thinking about who, who, who has the specific responsibility for each of, those additional, uh, each of those additional steps. What are the roles and responsibilities? What falls on you? What falls on the customer? So when it comes to services partners, when, as a consultant, um, you know, what we want to see is that you've got a checklist, right? Go out, write down a list of what are all of the things that you're going to look at for every project that you do that, that defines the readiness for this to go and be deployed to production and handed over to the customer. Um, you know, the checklist should, should be looking at things like, have we gone through testing? Have we gone through uh, enablement? Have we talked to the operations team? Do we have all of the, the different people in place? Have we gone through all of these different sort of stages of the process? Um, and then formalize those pieces as part of the project you want to have for every new thing that you build, these run books and playbooks built as part of the process. Now, you may not be the ones that actually build those. Maybe that's on the customer to do. Uh, maybe the customer says, yeah, our operations team already has this. You, you go and reuse a lot of the things that they've already got. That's okay, but again, the whole point here is that, that you've got a mechanism in place to ensure that this stuff is getting done and that you're not just throwing something over the wall um, and leaving customers in a position where they're not gonna be successful long-term. Um, and then also, you know, the enablement part of this is, is also really key. So how do you sit down and work with whoever's gonna be doing the operations? If you're a managed services provider, you may actually have, you may be holding the ball for this, and that's great, um, or it may be the customer that's gonna be responsible, but either way, how are you making sure that whoever is on the hook for operating the solution uh, understands how it works, knows what they need to do, uh, and is, is properly enabled before, uh, before you kind of finalize that. Um, and so again, if you want to take a look at an example of, of kind of these types of readiness checklists, take a look at this uh, oper operational readiness review example that we've got. Um, this goes through a lot of, of the, the key topics that you should be thinking about. Use it as a starting point to develop your own. Um, that's what it's there for. And, and yeah, so again, this is the kind of case where you don't need to go and reinvent the wheel. Absolutely leverage, leverage the resources that we've already got for you. Um, so finally, shifting over to the software side of things. Um, again, we talked about a lot of this in, in sort of the resilience section, but really the key here is just make sure that you've got documentation available to your customers that explain to them what are the expectations on, on their side. Um, you know, if there's specific configurations, so we see a lot of partners that have different tiers of, of offerings, right? So it's the same software, but in one case, it's sort of the, uh, you know, the developer um, toolkit that, that may only run in a single availability zone. And you have to upgrade to the enterprise tier if you really want to get an HA uh, 
you know, deployment model. That's perfectly fine. Um, you're welcome to, to kind of tier and, and offer your services however you want. Just make sure it's clear to customers what they need to do if they want to go, um, you know, and, and kind of get that next level. Um, you know, make sure that your documentation is clear when it comes to well-architected practices. So if, if you're asking customers to go and deploy things in their own accounts, you know, they need to know what ports are necessary to open up in my security groups. Uh, they need to understand kind of the, the policies and IAM roles that are, that are required for this. Um, make it easy on the customer to do the right thing and, and follow those kind of well-architected best practices. And, and sort of lastly, the, the overarching kind of key here is just we're trying to make sure that we're avoiding customer surprises. We don't want customers to go and, uh, you know, buy a product and then have a problem and down the road think, oh, well, I thought you were the one that was going to be backing up my data. Uh, but it turns out that, no, that was actually on their... Their, their side of the, the model. We've seen this happen. Customers obviously get very upset when that happens. And so, uh, again, the key here is we just want to make sure that everything is, is kind of clear and uh, obvious to customers so that they can make good decisions uh, when they're working with you. So that kind of, you know, closes out the, the, the kind of key technical best practices piece of this. Um, I do want to make a couple of quick call-outs. Uh, first of all, you know, the checklists that we have for each of our different programs, we've, we've got a, a separate individual checklist for every program that we've got. That is the ultimate sort of source of, source of truth. It's going to go into all of the details. It's got links in it that are going to link out to other resources and things like that. Highly, highly recommend that you all go and take a look at that. Um, you know, we, we covered a lot of ground here. We stayed at a relatively high level, so there's a lot of, of details that, that we left out. Uh, as we were describing all of this. So definitely please go take a look at that so that you understand sort of the full breadth and depth of, of what we're looking for. Um, also, the, the content in, in our checklist does get updated. So if you haven't looked at things in a while, you know, if you've done a competency application a few years ago and you're thinking about doing another one now, things have changed. Um, and so definitely go take a look at that and, and we'll continue to update that. We're constantly trying to make things better. We're constantly trying to simplify things for you as the partner as well as raise the bar for our customers. Um, so make sure you're checking those things out uh, and keeping an eye on the updates. Like Jing mentioned, if you're, I know we've got a lot of consulting partners here. Um, if you're thinking about applying for competency, there is going to be a pretty major update coming out uh, at the end of the year. Um, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, it, it, it's going to hopefully be a lot easier um, for you to use that new version of the checklist. Um, and then lastly, you know, we do have a high quality bar. That's, that's kind of the goal here is we want to raise the bar for our customers. We want to make sure that the partner solutions that we're endorsing really are uh, best in breed and, and are following all of these great practices. So, um, you know, so this is not necessarily going to be a trivial endeavor, um, but we strongly believe that implementing these best practices is going to be in your best interest as well long term as partners. Um, and so if you've got any questions about this, if you don't understand why we're asking you to do something that we're asking you to do, please come talk to us, you know, reach out to your PDM, reach out to your solutions architect. Um, we'd love to have that conversation and help kind of provide this guidance because we see this as something that's obviously very important for customers, but equally important for our partners as well. Um, so I also want to make a couple of call outs around kind of what's new, uh, some, of, some of the key things that, that we've been working on over this past year. Um, first of all, the foundational technical review. So this is applicable if you're a software partner, uh, specifically if you're a SaaS provider. Um, we've updated the foundational technical review relatively recently um, with some new controls around security, specifically in the networking space, as well as resiliency. Um, so again, we, we had sort of an entire section around resilience. We've now kind of codified that a little bit more explicitly in the FTR. This is not a big, heavy lift. Um, honestly, really what we're asking you to do is take a look at that shared responsibility model, make sure that you understand it, uh, and, and then sort of attest to the fact that you are designing your, your workload uh, in accordance with that. Um, we also, as Jing mentioned, have uh, a major update coming for the competency and service delivery programs uh, on the consulting side. Um, so again, the key thing there is if you've seen our checklists before, we used to ask for you know, a number of different customer examples, and then we wanted to see across all of these different, uh, different dimensions that we've talked about, you know, specific details on every single project that you've done about how you, you met sort of each one of these things. And we recognize that there are cases where, you know, one particular project you may not have done X, Y, or Z, either because, you know, you, you did sort of learn and, and, and you know, that, that just was a bad decision, or there are specific extenuating circumstances where it didn't make sense. So we've tried to simplify that down. What we're looking for, again, it's really now focused on kind of these overarching mechanisms and repeatable processes uh, so that you can show us more 
how are you going to make sure you're doing the right thing going forward? Um, and, and how have you set up things so that you're not just relying on having individual smart people doing the work, but rather have institutionalized knowledge that, that, uh, that can kind of drive consistency in the results that you're delivering. That's really what we care about. Um, and then lastly, the AWS MSP checklist has been updated. Um, if you haven't, if, if you are interested in the managed services program or if you're already in the managed services program and you're due for a renewal audit at some point, definitely take a look at that. We sort of restructured it entirely around the well-architected pillars. Um, there's not a ton of specific changes that you should need to make if you're already compliant with the previous version. There are a few areas where you've added some new uh, controls that, that you'll need to take a look at, um, but it's mostly kind of been reoriented and, and we kind of re, uh, redesigned a lot of the language to align better with well-architected. It's gonna make it easier for us long-term to, to kind of uh, continue to be better aligned with all of the other guidance that AWS is providing so that, that we can stay consistent there. So um, yeah, take a look there. So our hope is that at this point, uh, you've, you've kind of learned some, some tips and tricks. You understand some of the core technical best practices necessary in order to go and get validated. We hope that you will go now and, and pick a goal, you know, set a goal to go and achieve one of the, the differentiation programs or, or if you're just starting off, go and get, Go and complete your foundational technical review as a software partner. We've got a number of different, uh, different programs that you can go and uh, target in order to go and demonstrate to your customers and, and to our AWS sales field that, uh, that you are experts in, in a particular domain and that your solution is trusted. Um, foundational technical review is primarily for software partners. Um, we also have service validation, so if you've got specific integrations with individual AWS services or you do a lot of work as a consulting partner uh, around a specific service, um, that's a great one to, to take a look at. We also have competencies that validate industry and, um, and horizontal technology domain expertise. And then obviously there's managed services provider program, which is specifically looking at uh, kind of end-to-end -end, uh, practices that, that are helping to manage uh, customer workloads uh, end to end. Um, again, all of the topics that we talked about today are applicable across all of these different validations that we do. Uh, the specific nuances of exactly how do we check them, what are the specific criteria, et cetera, uh, vary. Again, that's why we want you to take a look at this checklist, but, uh, but yeah, you should be in a good position now to go and, and start uh, taking that next step. We've got a couple of links here if you want to take a look at, uh, again, getting to any of these individual uh, programs. The checklists and things are linked from there. Uh, you will need to log into Partner Central, so if you haven't already registered with Partner Central, uh, you need to do that in order to get access to our checklist, but, uh, but everything should be available from there. Um, and with that, we just wanted to say thank you very much for your time today. We've included our LinkedIn uh, information here. We would love to continue the conversation. We'll absolutely be outside um, to, to take any questions and, and discuss any, any kind of follow-ups that people have. Please do reach out to us online as well. If you've got questions after this, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and also, yeah, I'd like just for one final kind of piece of this presentation, if everyone could hold up their phones, if everyone's got, got their phone, if you could open up the AWS Events app real quick, and now you're ready to go and fill out the session survey. We really, really appreciate it. If you give us the feedback, um, we want to hear what you thought about this session. Uh, we, we read every single comment that comes in there. We want to make this better the next time we do it. So. Um, again, thanks a lot, and uh, looking forward to talking more uh, in the hallway. Thank you, guys.